for life today. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Open Bible Church San Jose Online. We are so thankful, so glad you've joined us today. We are really excited uh, because not only is this the uh, sixth and final message in our series called The Fight, this is uh, really coming down to crunch time for our Easter services that are coming up next week. But before we go there, grab your cell phones, check in with me if you would. If you would text to the number 408 547 4911, the word here, if you've used that number before, and your first name, we appreciate that. If you've never texted into that number before, text the word connect, and then just follow the prompts. Please give us your first and last name, just so we know who we're communicating with. And through this uh, system, we are able to communicate with you. You're able to communicate with us. Not only can you check in with your cell phones, but you can also give with your cell phones. If you text the word give to that very same number, uh, you can be able to uh, be taken to the giving portal on our website and you can give either a one-time gift or a recurring gift. We encourage a recurring gift that way you don't have to think about it and that way the consistency of your giving is always there and we appreciate that very much. Also we are receiving an offering for the the war in the Ukraine to help support our churches there. We have 44 churches, open Bible churches in the Ukraine that are being affected by this war. We also have three churches in Poland that are right on the border of the, uh, the Ukraine-Polish border and they are receiving refugees from uh, the, the war-torn country. And so we are raising funds through open Bible missions in order to support the efforts there that we are trying to uh, provide relief for those people. So if you would like to uh, test out the, uh, the giving portal, uh, go ahead and text give and then in the comment section uh, just put the word Ukraine or just war and we'll be able to direct those funds to our Open Bible Missions uh, fund in Des Moines, Iowa. Also, we are in our last week of our 21-day prayer and fasting journey. And if you have yet to join us, you can jump in right now with these next seven days as we're praying for our Easter gathering, our Easter celebration. For those who are coming who maybe don't know the Lord, those who are coming, maybe they are just kind of in that place in their life where they're just trying to figure things out. Uh, maybe there are those that are coming that will need a word of encouragement. So we, we invite you to be in prayer with us during this time and to not only pray but to also fast. If you have any questions about that, I'd love to talk to you about what that journey looks like. So coming up a week from today on the uh, 17th of April is our Easter celebration. We're going to have powerful worship. We're going to have an inspiring message. We are going to have giveaways. We're going to have food. Did I, did I say that loud enough? We're going to have food, snacks for you to be able to uh, enjoy. But also we're going to be having for the families, for the kids, we're going to have a bounce house. And then following the service will be an Easter egg hunt. And so we want you to be a part of that. We encourage you to be a part of that. And just by the way, for those of you that are wondering, the bounce house and the Easter egg hunt, just for the kids only. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Sorry, uh, ladies, it's just for kids only. But you can come and you can watch and you can be a part of that. We encourage you to do so. We're really excited about our Easter services coming up and we hope you are too. So please be in prayer. Please be in preparation to come. Please come and, and, and bring somebody with you. That's what the, the uh, encouragement is more than anything else, is to invite somebody to come and join you. So God bless you. In just a minute, our worship team is going to be coming out. Let's pray real quick. Heavenly Father, we just lift you up today. We celebrate you with our praise, with our worship. We honor you with your word, and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. God bless you.
I forever am in you. Maybe since my life has changed long before those rainy days, it's never really ever crossed my mind. Turn my back. Shelter from the storm, but instead I draw closer through these times. So I pray, bring me joy, bring me peace, bring the chance to be free, bring me. Welcome back, everyone. We are excited to be uh, moving forward in the sixth and final part of our series that we've entitled The Fight, talking about spiritual warfare. 
And just the whole series has been focused on preparing us for spiritual warfare against the enemy. The Bible is very clear that we struggle in three areas. We struggle with our own selfish, sinful desires. We, we struggle when somebody else has made a decision or a choice beyond our control that has affected us and, and has, um, has brought uh, negative things into our lives. But then we also uh, deal with an enemy. The Bible's very clear that we have an enemy and his name is called Satan. It's demonic and it's um, a, a warfare that is not physical but is spiritual and it involves a realm of, of the spirit that sometimes we don't give much thought to or that we're not very well versed in or aware of, but it is very real and it is there. But one of the things that we've been talking about is the fact that that as we're engaged in this war, we become engaged when we become a follower of Christ. When we invite Jesus Christ into our heart as our Lord and Savior, what ends up happening is we're brought into not only the family of, family of God, but also the army of God, because we are called to spiritual warfare. Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verses 10 through 18, 17, 18, talks about putting on the full armor of God. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 talks about the, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty and aid to bringing down any strongholds. And it's also in 2 Corinthians where it talks about the fact that our, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces that are in this dark world. And so all of these verses are there to remind us that we have a, an enemy that we are in battle with. But what we must remember is, is that according to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we, we're aware of his schemes, we're aware of his fighting tactics. And because we're aware of his fighting tactics, we have been given spiritual weapons by God in which to fight back or to protect ourselves or to advance. We talked about the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We talked about worship as a weapon and how our worship is mighty and it can bring down strongholds and, and it can and it can release the um, the spirit of God in, in situations in our lives. We talk about prayer and fasting and as I mentioned earlier we're right in the middle of a time of prayer and fasting right now 21 days in preparation for our um, our service uh, in next week. Also, uh, we have to realize that there's a battle plan that God has for us to walk out. We, we understand and realize that the enemy has a plan against us. The Bible says that he has come to rob, to kill, and to destroy. He's very, um, he's very personalized in how he attacks us. He deals with me differently than he, he deals with you because he knows where my weaknesses are. He knows where my struggles are, and he uses the, the uh, temptations and the things of this world to, to come against those areas of my life that he knows that I stumble and fall most frequently with. And same with you. He knows your weaknesses, so he's got a battle plan against you. But so does God. But God has a battle plan against him. We must never forget that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So who is in the world? The enemy, Satan. Who is in me? God, his spirit my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Then we talked about a weapon that that's kind of seems contrary to our, our efforts here. It's a weapon of surrender. And what, it, what that means is we don't surrender to the enemy, but we surrender to God to allow God the full, uh, so that the full effect of God's power can be used through us. We get out of our own way and we let God do what he needs to do now there's our responsibility, there's our effort that we put into it, but it is God who, who helps us to advance. It is God who brings us the victory. And so today, number six, we're going to be talking about the power of his blood and the power of our testimony. And this is found in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. And it says that they triumphed over him or they overcame him. And uh, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Who did they overcome? Direct reference to Satan himself. And who are they? The believers. These are the ones who were the followers of Christ. And they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of the testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink 
from death. And it goes on in verse 12 to say, Therefore rejoice, you heavens and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. And this is, what, this is the, the, the mentality of the enemy that we're dealing with. It says, he is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. The enemy knows that, that there's, a coming, there's going to be a time when Jesus comes back and he's going to set everything in motion for, to be able to set up the, uh, the heavenly kingdom that we're going to be ushered into either through the rapture or through death and our, and our own uh, resurrection, so to speak. So A.W. Tozier said this. He said, I'm not afraid of the devil. The devil can handle me. He's got judo I never heard of, but he can't handle the one to whom I'm joined. He can't handle the one to whom I'm united. He can't handle the one whose nature dwells in my nature. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I love what, um, what the, uh, uh, the Apostle John wrote. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, he, he kind of sets the tone for, um, for why we have victory over the enemy. The one who does what is sinful, 1 John 3, 8, is of the devil. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil. Because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. So sin is very much part of his effort to bring destruction into our lives. And then it says this, the reason the Son of God appeared, the reason the Son of God came was to destroy the devil's work. So Jesus came in order that, that we might have the victory over the work of the enemy, which was to allow sin to destroy God's people, all people, so to speak. So when we look at where it says, and they overcame him by what? the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. I want to talk about the first thing in that, in that uh, scripture that talks about, and they overcame him by what? The blood of the Lamb. And this goes back to the time in Egypt when Pharaoh was refusing to allow the nation of Israel to, to leave Israel, who, or excuse me, leave Egypt, because they had uh, the Israelites in bondage, and Pharaoh refused to let them go. So on the 10th, Plague, finally, the Spirit of God just absolutely um, told Moses, you tell your people to put the blood of a lamb over their doorposts, and the death angel will come. And as he passes through the, the, the land, anyone that has that blood of the lamb over their doorposts, the death angel will pass over, but anyone who does not have it, their firstborn sons will die. And so there was weeping and wailing in Israel the next, or in Egypt the next day after the, the lamb or the death angel had passed through all of the Israelites who had placed the blood of the lamb in obedience over their doorposts were spared. But all of the Egyptians, they, they lost their firstborn sons from, from the animals to the, to the um, humans that were there. And so the power of, of the blood of protection is, is, is from that very moment, from that very illustration uh, representative of what the blood of Christ does. Let me explain that just a little bit more detail. So there is power in the blood. Remember that old hymn? There's power, power, wonder working power in the blood. Well, we win, we have victory because of Jesus and the blood that he shed on the cross. It was because of that shed blood that we can stand in victory against the enemy and before God. Nothing else. It is the blood of Jesus that covers our sin. You see, the price of our salvation was paid for by this blood, by the sacrifice that Jesus made. First Peter 1 verses 18 through 19 says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish uh, or defect. So we hear that word redeem. We hear that word redemption, especially in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches 
of God's grace. What does that mean? To redeem means to buy back or to secure the freedom of someone who was in bondage. Because of our sins, uh, we all were or continue to be in, in spiritual captivity. Our violations of God's law means that we deserve his righteous wrath. But in Christ, by the shedding of his blood, which forgives our sins before God, he purchases our freedom from justice and from the power of Satan. And then in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, it says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sin, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And verse 15 says, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. And what does it say in, in Romans chapter 12? It says, And we triumph over him. By what? The blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. And so here what it says in Colossians 2.15, And they triumphed over them by the cross. And the cross was where Jesus shed. He died by shedding his blood um, on the cross. And then as a result of that, we're able to have a connection with God also by his blood. Hebrews 10.19, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. That most holy place is that, is that place where the Spirit of God dwells and the presence of God reigns. And we're able to enter into that place all because of the blood. That's where we are able to connect with God. And again, in Ephesians chapter 2, um, verse 12, it says, Remember at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship, citizenship in Israel and foreigners, to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. Again, as we read in verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Again, talking about the redemption and talking about the restoration of our lives before him. How? By his blood. In 1 Peter 3:18. For Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, to do what? To bring you to God. Jesus suffered. He was beaten. He was bruised. He was brutalized. And he, he was pierced. And he shed his blood so that we might be forgiven. And then we're cleansed because of this blood. We're cleansed and we're forgiven by his blood. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 says, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. 1 John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. So we are cleansed and forgiven. How and why? Because of his blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. And the blood of Jesus, his son, as it, as, because it was shed, it will purify us from all of our sin. What's Satan's greatest weapon? To tempt us into sin, to destroy. Why? Because the wage of sin, the wages of sin is death. And if the enemy can keep us, or if, the, if God can keep us from falling into the trap of sin, he, he gives us that victory. And the, one, and the way that he helps us to overcome that is through his blood. And then because of his blood, we are fully accepted by God. Romans chapter 5 verse 9 says, now we have been justified by his blood. We have been justified by his blood. What does it mean? Justified is courtroom language. The prosecution and the defense will each present their case and the judge or the jury will make a declaration that either you are righteous or innocent or you are condemned. The defendant is either guilty as charged or declared to be in right standing with the law, which means justified or innocent. Jesus willingly shed his own blood, not for his own sins because he had none, but for ours. The spilling of his blood to cover our sins made it possible for us to share in his righteousness by joining us to him through faith. 
Without his blood, our unrighteousness would remain unaddressed. We could not stand with him at the final judgment and receive with him his father's declaration to be declared righteous before him, innocent of our, of our sin. Now, many of us know we are not innocent by any means, but because of what he did, we are declared innocent because of mercy and because of grace by the blood of Jesus. I'm so thankful for that. Revelation chapter 5 uh, verse 7 through 9, in a snippet says, I saw a lamb looking as, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders all fell down before the lamb. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe, language, and people, and nation. You purchased, you redeemed, you connected with, you, you forgave, you declared righteous everyone, every person from every tribe, language, and people, and nation. And again, Revelation 12, 11, and they triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. So we talked about the power of the blood. It is through the blood that we have relationship with God. And then something happens in our lives. We become transformed. We become changed. We become um, we become thrilled, excited, broken. We become humbled. All of these things happen when we're brought into the kingdom of God. But what it does is it, is it gives us a story to tell. And that story to tell is our testimony. So what is a testimony? Well, Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines it in several ways. It says, it is the first-hand authentication of a fact. Again, going to the court of law, it is offering an eyewitness, offering eyewitness testimony is one of the most compelling ways to convince a jury. And in the community of faith, our churches, in our conversations with others, a testimony is simply sharing, what has God done for me? What can God do for you? It is telling your own personal story. You see, many people consider their testimony to be a life transformed by Christ, which part of it is. But each of us who serves God has hundreds, if not thousands of stories about the goodness of God and what he has done. And so it's just not your story about your conversion. It is your story about the ongoing support and ongoing care an ongoing work of God in your life and in my life. See, each of those is a testimony. And this passage in Revelation shows us how key our testimonies are to overcoming the work of the enemy. It is one reason why we must continually share our stories of what God is doing in our midst. Now again, this is, this is our story and as a kid growing up, or when I was, uh, rec when I was saved at 17, um, I, I can remember hearing all these uh, enthralling stories of how God saved these people from horrible pasts and horrible lives. And, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm not that bad. I, I, I wasn't a drug dealer. I, I wasn't a prostitute. I, I, I wasn't... Uh, a murderer or a thief. I, I didn't do horrible things. I didn't say, you know, uh, horrible things. I, I was just a kid, and, and yet one of the things about my testimony is just that. I was just a kid, and God reached down and, and, and saved me. And I'm going to tell you about it in just, just a little bit. But we've got to be careful that we don't exaggerate or we don't embellish a little bit about what our story is all about. We need to be truthful, we need to be factful, and we need to be careful that we don't brag and glorify ourselves 
which is what some people purposely but also unknowingly do. Instead of talking about Jesus, they use it as an opportunity to talk about themselves, which is not really a testimony. I'm pretty sure you heard people even bragging about their past life before Christ as if it were cool. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, it says that this is how we, we must look at ourselves. In your heart, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for what? To give the reason for the hope that you have. It has nothing to do with you, but it's about the hope that lives in your heart. And we do this with gentleness and respect. We do this with gentleness and respect. You see, the power of your testimony is not in how bad you were, but it's in how good he is. Say amen. Amen. It's not how bad you were, but it's how good God is in our lives. Psalm 71, 15, the psalmist said, I will tell everyone about your righteousness. All day long I will proclaim your saving power, though I am not skilled with words. Boy, I relate to that a lot of times. I am not skilled with words. You know, this is one of the things I think we all must realize is that, that one of the biggest struggles we have is how do we share our testimony? What do we say? Um, do I quote scriptures? Do I talk about the Bible? Do I, do I in, involve a little bit of theology or anything like that? And no, no. David or the psalmist wrote this and he did so in such a way that we, it doesn't matter whether you're skilled or unskilled. What matters is if you just start sharing about what God has done in your life. The power of a testimony. Uh, maybe you've heard this expression before. Only God can turn a mess into a message, a test into a testimony, or a trial into a triumph, and a victim into victory. And so that's what a testimony is all about, how God has taken the, the stuff in your life and has, has made you a better person or has done a, a great work in, in changing your life. So we are witnesses to this. We're witnesses of what the blood of Jesus does in our life. And remember we talked about the forgiveness, the redemption, talked about being declared righteous and justified before God. It, it connects us with God. All the stuff with the blood gives us a powerful testimony to share about what Jesus has done in our lives in order to bring us closer to God. You see, we are a witness to God's power of forgiveness and of his redemptive uh, nature in our lives. You see, it is your story that can be the key that can unlock somebody else's Prison. Do you realize that, that when we share our testimony, we are, we are uh, using it as a weapon against the enemy because the person you share your testimony with may come one step closer to God because of what you, what you are sharing. That person may be so discouraged and then they hear your testimony and that just empowers them and fires them up to, to uh, go all in with God. We never know what happens when we share our testimony. You see, your story is the key that can unlock somebody else's prison, that can lift somebody else's frustrations and, and hurt and pain. You see, it is designed not just to save you, but it is to be used to save others as well. My story is personal. It's about how Jesus saved me. But my story has been instrumental in, in saving other people as well and giving them a story for them to share. My story is important to me, but it's also important that I am sharing it with others. The unbelieving world, Billy Graham said this, he said, the unbelieving world should see our testimony lived out daily because it may just point them to the Savior. It is my prayer and my hope that my testimony lead somebody to Jesus. So what is my testimony? You see, I grew up exposed to the faith. I wasn't serving Jesus. Um, I knew of him. I went to church. I read my Bible. I memorized scripture. I, I prayed. 
but it was all um, it was all surface level, and it wasn't based on a relationship. It was based on keeping me out of trouble. It was based on making me feel better, feel safe. It was all these things that that were all about me. Until um, I walked away from the church when I was 13 years old. I, I, I had quit going. I'd go every so often to appease my mom, but really I had quit going. Mentally, I wasn't there. I, I, I may have been there in bodily form, but my mind was elsewhere, and it was just really a, a waste of my time. Started doing some things I'm not proud of. I started getting myself in trouble. I started making really poor decisions with my life up through the age of 16, and I just really felt empty. And I really wondered, God, or I really wondered if there was anything more out there. And probably thought maybe, you know, okay, God, what, is there any more out there? But I never really engaged with him. And I just basically tried to figure it out on my own. And that's how I lived the next oh, six to eight months of my life. Um, uh, at, at, when I, I was just re about ready to turn 17. And the, God took me away from all the influences that I had in my life for about six months until I met um, some, some people, some, some friends of mine that introduced me to what a real relationship with Jesus looked like. And as I, as I walked through that with them, I really didn't want to engage um, an, an, until a, um, an incident happened in their lives and I saw how Jesus' love just really made a difference for them and I thought, that's what I want. That's what I was missing. I mean, I just made that connection and I just saw that that was the missing piece in my life. So that next Sunday, they had been inviting me to church all along and I said, no, Ben, they did that. Don't like it, don't want it. It's good for you, not for me. And I just basically held them at bay until that Sunday that I decided to go. And let me tell you what, I never looked back. It changed my life. I didn't commit my life to Christ at that time, but it changed my life because I saw what I was, what I was hungry for. I saw in the lives of the people in this little church in Jefferson, Iowa, the peace that I was missing out of my life. And about three or four months later, I committed my life to Christ. And then about five years later, God called me to Bible college and led me into the ministry. And the rest of my life is, is history. But it was a really powerful experience that I walked through and it really made all the difference in the world. You see, I realized that my faith wasn't something that was based on my performance, but it was based on a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. See, I wasn't sure if I was going to go to heaven or not. And when I finally made that decision to go to the altar, and I, I know exactly where I prayed, I can take you back to that little church and I can point to the corner of the altar that I prayed at, and I remember specifically praying for Jesus to come into my life, to change my life. And when I did so, it was almost like a, a light turned on in my head because it was at that point that I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew that I was going to heaven. I knew something had changed in my life. And I, I will always be thankful for that, that church. I will always be thankful for that opportunity that changed my life, my eternity, forever. You see, the gospel somebody once shared with me is nothing more than one beggar telling another beggar where he found bread. And the author of that quote is D.T. Niles. But the idea of that is, is all we're doing is we're just sharing, sharing uh, our story. We're just telling another person where we found bread, telling another person where we found eternal life. And I think that that's what's really vital is because that's the power of your testimony. It's because it's your story. Nobody can argue with that. Nobody can debate that. This was your personal experience and what Jesus has done in your life in regard to this aspect of salvation and all the other things that God does, but specifically this. So I had an interesting thing happen about 40 years ago. And I was in the um, in the town library, and I was doing some work uh, in preparation for a junior college class that I was in, a sociology class. And as I was working on a term paper, this young gal came up to me. And she began to just talk to me, and I'm thinking, oh, i got to get all this work done. I don't have time for this conversation. 
She asked me what I was writing. She asked me why I was writing it. She asked me what the, the, the main purpose of my, of my intent was. And it, it was all focused around a, a faith-based uh, concept. And so then she started talking to me about church and she started talking to me about faith. The conversation lasted about two hours. And uh, when the conversation was over, she walked away and I have never seen her again. But about six months after that, which was about 40 years ago, I received a card in the mail. And it, it's a handwritten card and it says on the outside, I want to share my joy with you. And on the inside, it says, his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. And this was written by the gal that I had talked to that, uh, that night in the library in Jefferson, Iowa. And her name was Colleen. And Colleen had a letter in here that she wrote me. And I'm going to read some of the snippets of what she, of, of what she wrote. And she said this, she said, I received, um, uh, she said this, she said, I want to share my joy with you. His name is Jesus. And she said, I wanted to let you know that I'm still thinking about you and the long talk that we had in the library that one day. Again, this is about six months after we had this conversation. I hope that you weren't discouraged because things didn't start changing in my life right away. I guess we just have to let God work in his own way and in his own time. I thought about our talk a lot of these last couple of months, and I'm so happy these days because I'm finally at home, at home with the Lord. I've recently returned from a retreat and have since been so filled with God's peace and joy that I sometimes think I'll burst. It is so great. God used you that day in the library. He used you to be a witness to me and to talk to me about what life with Jesus was like. I'll admit that some of the things that you told me were hard to understand at times, and when I left, I thought a lot about what you said, but never really applied it to my life. You know, at first I was scared to be a Christian. I wasn't so much concerned about what people would say as I was about what Jesus had in store for me. But just the other day in church, I told him to use me in whatever way he wanted to and to do with my life whatever he, not me, thought was best. I can't explain what peace came over me when I surrendered myself to him. It seems funny how my whole life outlook, uh, my whole outlook on life has changed. Everything seems too beautiful to be true. I don't worry much anymore because he does all of that for me. And she said this, thank you for sharing with me, love, Colleen. And I, I have always cherished that note. Again, this note is over 40 years old, and it still just brings tears to my eyes to think that I took that conversation as more of a hindrance than something that could change somebody's life. And you know, the thing about that is, is, is I didn't realize that I was in the middle of warfare for a soul. But Jesus did. The Holy Spirit did. And the Holy Spirit led Colleen to me that night to sit across that table from me, to ask me those questions, and to, and to be inquisitive about things of faith. And as a result of that, those seeds that were planted, the Holy Spirit was able to take and bring to fruition, fruition in her life about six months later. I will forever be indebted to Colleen for writing this note to say this to me because it just reminded me of the importance of the power of our testimony when we share it with others. Revelation 12, 11 says this, and they did what? Triumphed over him. You see, that's the whole goal in a war is to triumph over the enemy. And they triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb, what Jesus did on the cross, the power that's found in his blood, and by the word of their testimony. You see, that's from me. The blood of the Lamb is from him. But the blood of the Lamb is what gives me the words to share in my story that others may want to hear. 
And they did not love their lives so much as to what? Shrink from death. You see, death was Satan's tool to keep people in bondage. But according to Rev, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians 15, that was the thing that Jesus conquered, vanquished, was death. And I love what the writer in Hebrews said as I close this morning. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 36 through 39, he said, you need to persevere. That's what we need to do in this battle. We need to persevere. We need to keep pushing forward. We need to keep hanging on and hanging in. Persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. When you're done and you're standing before God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he says, he who is coming will come and will not delay. You see, we're fighting until the very end. We are in battle until the very end. And then when he comes, he will not delay. And then he goes on to say, but my righteous one will live by faith. We're righteous because of his blood. We're justified because of what he did on the cross. And his righteous one will live by faith. But he says, I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. So what does it say in Revelation 12? It says, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. I take no pleasure in Hebrews in the one who shrinks back. And I love how he ends this sentence. He says, but we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who who have faith and are saved. Ladies and gentlemen, this morning we have faith and we are saved because of what he did on the cross. And we have the words to prove it. We have the power of our testimony to prove it. As we close out our, our time together today, as we close out this six-week series, please, please, please be reminded that you have weapons of spiritual warfare and you have the, um, and you have the, the uh, assurance of God in how to use them. And as we talked about today, we have authority and power over the enemy. We triumph over him by his blood and by our testimony. His blood and our testimony. If you need help to put your testimony together, I would love to talk to you more about that. Please reach out. Send me a text. Call me, send me an email, whatever, whatever way that you can uh, get a hold of me. If you need help putting your testimony together and keeping it short and sweet and to the point, I'd love to work with you on that. Why? Because there's power in your testimony today. God bless you. We love you. We appreciate you. Please be in prayer. Please fast with us in this next seven days as we complete our 21-day journey in prayer and fasting, as we pray for the church, as we pray for the kingdom of heaven to overcome the kingdom of darkness and the Easter celebration that, that gives an opportunity for that to happen. Please come with us as we, as we wreak havoc in the, uh, in the uh, enemy's, enemy's land, as we come back and we take by force that which God um, owns and which God wants, and that is the lives and the souls of those who don't know him yet. God bless you, and uh, please, as I said, be in prayer, and we'll see you next week. If you're online, um, we appreciate the fact that you're online, but if you are venturing out, you're going to Costco, you're going to Safeway, you're going to stores, you're going to work, you can come to church. Come to church on Easter Sunday. We'd love to see you. God bless you, and we'll see you next week. Drawing closer by grace and love